Hello everyone and welcome back to the Kohi Game Engine series. Today we're going to tackle the swap chain. Really quick though, I would like to take a quick second and thank the partners of the channel, AR Slayer and Wen Shang. The partner is the highest tier of supporter on the channel. And so I just wanted to say thank you to our partners as well as our other supporters that are listed here on the screen. So if you're interested in supporting the channel, there are a couple ways to do that now. First off, I have channel memberships available. You can access that by clicking the join button below this video. I'll also provide a link to a video that I have describing the memberships. And I also have a Patreon page, which is patreon.com forward slash Travis Roman. Thank you all very much for your support. It is greatly appreciated. So really quickly, before we get into the swap chain itself, I wanted to address a couple things that came up from the last video. So there's a couple small changes, uh, things that we missed in the last video that need to be corrected uh, before we continue. So the first one of those things is within the Vulkan renderer backend, within the shutdown sequence, uh, we were not destroying the device or the surface. So we will wanna go ahead and destroy uh, both of those things because otherwise it will throw a validation error when we exit the application and that is obviously no bueno. So that's the first thing. And the second item is in Vulkan device. A few of you had issues with this particular section of code because some GPUs do not actually have the ability to have more than one queue for the graphics slash present queue family. Uh, they are all sort of on the same family and uh, there's only one queue available. And, and in those cases, uh, this failed. So this was actually here um, for something that is gonna wind up being uh, added in the future when we multi-thread the renderer. Uh, but for now, we can just safely disable this and uh, leave it here and we'll come back and, and re-enable it when we actually need it. But we don't need it for now. And uh, when we go to tackle that, uh, we will actually handle this properly. So I've gone ahead and disable this for now. Okay, so with both of those things done, I'm going to go ahead now and create the swap chain. But before I do, I want to quickly describe what a swap chain is because we've sort of skirted around that issue. So a swap chain is basically, you can think of it as a queue of images uh, that are waiting to be sort of presented to the screen. And it's not exactly a queue like what we've dealt with in other places like these particular queues, right? It's not a queue in that sense. It's sort of a, a thing of its own. And basically the way that this works is our application will acquire one of those images to render to. And once the rendering is complete, that image is then returned back to the swap chain for later presentation. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna set up the swap chain to get some of those things in place, right? So um, for those of you who are coming from OpenGL, this is something that you did not have to do in OpenGL because OpenGL provided you with a default frame buffer. Frame buffers are something that we're gonna come back to, but we do not have that concept in Vulkan. So this is something that is a little bit new to uh, you OpenGL guys. Uh, those of you who have been programming uh, against DirectX since I believe it was version 10 should be familiar at least with the, the basic premise of a swap chain. But anyway, with all that out of the way, let's go ahead and start the creation of the swap chain. So under renderer Vulkan, we're gonna to wanna to create a new file and we're gonna call that vulkanswapchain.h. So as you may expect, we are going to include Vulkan types INL and a pragma once, okay? So as with a lot of our other structures, we are actually going to have a struct that we're gonna to need to create so before we move on here, I actually want to go into Vulkan types because we are actually going to need a new structure to hold our swap chain. So right below our device, we are going to type def a swap chain, Vulkan swap chain structure, okay? And in this, we are going to hold several pieces of data. First, we are going to hold something called the image format. Now this is the format of the images that I discussed earlier that we render to. So Vulkan is actually requiring us to uh, know and understand the format of the image that we are going to be rendering to. So that is what that is for. We are then gonna hold the total 
max number of frames in flight uh, that can be sort of rendered to at once. And we'll come back to this, um, but basically we just need to hold this count somewhere and that's where we're gonna hold it. Next, we need a handle to the actual Vulkan swap chain itself. So this is a extension, so it's a VK swap chain KHR. That's the actual handle, that's where we're gonna keep that. Next, we're going to keep a count of the images and an array of the images. And the reason that we're not using a D array for this will become apparent in the near future. And we're also gonna hold an array of VK image views. So uh, images and image views, I'll sort of come back to as we progress through that, but understand at the moment, uh, basically on the surface, that images are not accessed directly in Vulkan. An image, for lack of a better explanation, is sort of the equivalent of an OpenGL texture, if you will. So we don't actually directly access those things. We access images through views in Vulkan. And so anytime we have an image, we have an accompanying view. Okay. And for right now, uh, that is all we are going to add to this. We are going to have to add a couple of extra things to this uh, once we get a little bit further along, but for right now, um, this will suffice. So let's go back to Vulcan Swap Chain. And as we've done in other places, we will have a Vulcan Swap Chain create. So it takes in a context, width and height, and uh, a pointer to a swap chain struct uh, as output, right? The next thing we're going to have is uh, not quite a destroy, but a recreate. Um, so why would we have a create and a recreate? Well, there are various circumstances that can occur that can cause us to actually have to recreate our swap chain. And I'll touch on a couple of those now and we'll get into uh, a little bit more detail as we sort of fill this out, but basically, when a swap chain is created, it is immutable. So that means that you, once it's created, you can't edit it, you can't change it. And so when certain events occur, such as a window resize, for example, you would need to use different uh, sized images, potentially a different format. Um, and whenever something like that occurs, you actually have to recreate the swap chain. Um, because as I said before, it's immutable. You can't change those things after the fact. So. Whenever that happens, we'll have to recreate the swap chain, but it doesn't necessarily require that we recreate all of the resources used by that swap chain. So create and recreate are actually different for a reason. Um, and we'll get into some of the reasons for that later on. Next, as you might expect, we have destroy. Pretty self-explanatory stuff. After that, we have a method called Vulcan swap chain acquire next image index. And so if you recall when I was talking about how a swap chain has a reference to multiple images and we sort of cycle through those images, uh, this one is basically, this method is basically what gives us the index of the next image to be used uh, so that we can go ahead and acquire that from the swap chain, right? Uh, and this will allow us to render to that image and allow that image to be uh, eventually returned to the queue to be presented. Which brings me to my next function, which is Vulkan swap chain present. Okay, so there's a lot of things in here that we actually have not uh, seen yet. We will get through all of the explanations of these things, but um, we have our context, our swap chain, um, a timeout, semaphore, and a fence. I'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, we also have a, uh, a pointer to an out image index on this guy, and then in this one it takes almost um, and in this one, it takes also the context and the swap chain. It takes in the, uh, the graphics queue, the present queue, and then a semaphore as well, as well as a present image index. And so we'll be covering all these things in more detail as we fill these out. But uh, this is the structure of what our swap chain is going to look like, at least from the outside. Inside, things are gonna be a little bit different. So first, we'll create a new file. Call it Vulcan swap chain C. And there's a few includes we're going to need. So uh, we also obviously need the Vulcan swap chain H. We need the logger. We are going to need some memory functions. And then we are also going to need the device. And there is actually another one we're going to need uh, in a bit, but we have to create that first. Okay. So 
if we look at our header, we have create and recreate. And as you might imagine, there are a lot of things that are actually shared by these two methods. So we don't actually want to code all that stuff twice, right? We don't want to repeat ourselves. And so we're actually going to create some internal methods to be used for the creation and destruction of a swap chain. And we're going to do that so that we can just call the same method um, from more than one place and reuse our code, right? So we're going to have sort of these internally created um, or these internal create and destroy methods, which just take the context, the size of the swap chain, which is basically in our case going to be the window size, at least initially, uh, and then a pointer to the swap chain. And then um, the destroy obviously just takes the context and a pointer to the swap chain, okay? Which makes uh, the definition of create dead simple, right? All it does is actually call this create method under the hood and that's it, right? And as you might imagine, recreate calls destroy first and then create, okay? So that's pretty straightforward stuff. Obviously all the complexity lies in here. All right, and then as you might also imagine, swap chain destroy simply calls destroy internally. Again, pretty straightforward stuff. Okay, so the next method is our acquire next image index, right? That's the next thing we have to fill out. So let's go ahead and define our function body. And basically what we're gonna call is something called VK acquire next image KHR. And this guy requires all kinds of stuff. This is basically what is going to return our image index. So it takes a device, it takes a swap chain, uh, the internal, our internal handle to that. It takes a timeout in nanoseconds, uh, basically saying that if this uh, operation does not complete within that timeout that it goes ahead and uh, returns an error here. And then it takes something called a semaphore and a fence. Now, semaphores and fences are used for synchronization. So the difference between semaphores and fences is fences are used to synchronize operations between your actual application and the GPU. Um, so operations happening on the GPU. So it basically is a way to synchronize between those two. Whereas semaphores are a way to synchronize GPU operations with other GPU operations. So GPUs are designed to be multi-threaded and uh, do things sort of asynchronously. And so we have to have some way to be able to synchronize at those two different levels. And we're gonna wind up using both quite a lot throughout this, at least in our initial setup stages. And so, for now, you can just think of that as the basic difference where uh, fences are designed to sync between GPU and application, whereas semaphores are designed to synchronize between GPU and GPU, okay? And so uh, we are going to go into the creation and use of these things a little bit more as we step into it. For now, all we're doing is passing them through um, as properties to this particular function. So. Uh, that's all I want to cover on that for now, and we're actually going to have a another video explaining this in further detail. Okay, so uh, finally here we have a pointer to uh, a uint32, which is our image index that it returns, right? And of course, all of this returns a VK result, which we'll need to track as well. So with that said, this is how we're going to make that call. So we're gonna pass the logical device, we're going to pass the handle to the swap chain, we're gonna just pass through the timeout nanoseconds, the image available sem semaphore, fence, and out image index, okay? And so uh, this is basically going to be responsible for setting this guy, all right? But then we have this result, and if we go ahead and pull up, if we pull up the spec for this particular function, we see that the return codes are as followed. So um, on a success, we get VK success. Uh, timeout technically counts as a success. Um, not ready and suboptimal KHR also technically count as success. Now, these uh, particular events here, we are gonna treat those um, either as warnings or, or errors, uh, but they are things that Vulkan doesn't necessarily consider an error um, that 
should be terminal to the application. Um, so uh, we are going to treat these a little bit different, but uh, these are the ones that we're going to be looking for. And then if we get any of these, obviously we are going to uh, treat it as an error and um, and throw an error accordingly. Okay. So with that said, here is how we are going to analyze the result. So we are going to check the result to see if it's out of date. Now out of date um, can happen on a window resize, for example. Um, it just basically means that the swap chain needs to be recreated, okay? And so if that happens, we are gonna call our swap chain recreate here. Now I realize we've got some properties here that we um, do not have yet filled out. We'll have to go back and fill those out. But uh, all we're gonna do basically here is say, all right, um, if it's out of date, we're gonna recreate the swap chain and we're gonna return false here, which uh, basically indicates that this operation is not deemed successful, but it's not necessarily a fatal error at this point, okay? However, um, if we are not out of date, then we want to make sure also, um, if we are not in a success state and the result is not equal to suboptimal KHR, then at this point, we go ahead and fail, right? Because we've, we've, we've gotten some sort of result that is not good, basically, like a device lost or something like that. And that's a little bit more critical than we want to deal with at this level, at least for now. Um, when we come back and do a stability pass, uh, we will probably revisit this section of code. But for now, I'm just going to specifically say, hey, we failed to acquire, acquire the, uh, the swap chain image um, because of this, okay? And we're gonna return false there. So if we get past all those cases, in other words, uh, basically if we have result is equal to success, then we are gonna go ahead and return true. And uh, that is pretty much it for this function, okay? It's pretty simple. So um, I guess let me go hop over to the context real quick and add the frame bu buffer width and frame buffer height. Now. You might be asking, uh, we've talked about frame buffers a little bit, what are frame buffers and why do we care about the width and height? So the width and height of the frame buffer is basically uh, supposed to match the size of the image that we're gonna be using. And a frame buffer also is used as part of a render pass, which uh, has a reference to those images uh, that we are gonna be using. So um, our frame buffer we'll also need to know about a width and a height, which we're also going to use here because that happens to be, uh, in our case, the window width and window height. So um, I know that's kind of a lot to take in. It'll make a little bit more sense once we finally get everything hooked up, but uh, we're gonna keep the frame buffer width and frame buffer height at the context level because uh, there are parts of the renderer that may need to know that. So let's go ahead and go back to our context, okay? And right here at the top, we're just gonna put in frame buffer width and height. And we'll worry about setting these later, okay? So now that that's fixed, this function is complete. All right, so the next thing in our list is swap chain present. So that's what we're gonna fill out now. Okay, or the thing that we're gonna wanna call is this function here, which is VKQ present KHR. So this is the actual Vulkan uh, function, which performs the presentation of uh, a rendered to image within the swap chain. So what we have here is it takes in a Q and then it takes in a present info KHR. So we're gonna need to go ahead and create this and then it's going to be, uh, we're gonna pass it the address of that, okay? So basically what this means is whenever we call this, we are essentially returning the image at the index that we're providing back to the swap chain for presentation, okay? And uh, that does wind up being a queued operation. So uh, we do need a semaphore for that. And then uh, of course we need the graphics queue in the presentation queue for that as well. And you'll see where we need that in just a second. So our present info, of course, we take in our structure type, uh, our wait semaphores, which is basically saying uh, we need to wait uh, for this semaphore to be flagged as complete, 
uh, whatever operation this is bound to needs to be needs to say hey we're done um, and so we're basically saying we have one of those and then uh, this is expecting an array of those things, which we only have one, so we're just passing the address of that. We have one swap chain. You can technically have multiple uh, multiple swap chains, but in this case, we're just doing one. And then an array of that, which we're just passing the address of the handle to that. And then we have uh, the image indices, which again, we can have more than one. In this case, we're only gonna have one. So we're gonna pass the address of the present image index that's passed in. So to give you a little bit of context, whatever image index is retrieved here is what winds up getting passed in here and then ultimately used, okay? And then uh, results, we're not actually using that. So we're just going to go ahead and set that to null. Uh, I realize that that's being done here. I just wanted to sort of be explicit about it, okay? So uh, our next call is the one that uh, does the th the thing that makes stuff visible, <laughs> for lack of a better term, right? So that's our VK Q present KHR. So this is what takes uh, the image back to the swap chain and presents it, um, or puts it in a queue to be presented rather. Okay, and in this case, we are passing the present queue. Now, obviously, this returns a VK result. So the VK result is very similar to this guy up here. The code looks uh, at least somewhat similar. So if the result is out of date, uh, KHR, meaning the swap chain needs to be recreated or suboptimal, which again means it needs to be recreated, we are gonna go ahead and kick off a recreation. Again, just like we did up here, okay? Otherwise, if the result is not equal to success and by proxy not equal to one of these things, then we had something happen where um, we had some sort of error presenting the swap chain image, okay? And so we're gonna throw a fatal error in that case. Okay, so for now, uh, this is all that we are gonna do with present, okay? Uh, we are gonna need to add a little bit more to this uh, in the near future, but for right now, this is where we're gonna end it, okay? So we have uh, our entire public interface created here. But then uh, we actually have these guys, which we've not filled out yet. So I'm actually just gonna copy these. And these are what we need to fill out next. So this is where uh, a lot of the work actually happens. The first thing that we're gonna do in Create is we're gonna set up a couple things. We're gonna set up something called our swap chain extent, which basically is our size, if you will. And we're gonna take the width and height and we're gonna use that as our extent. So we have to create this uh, VK extent 2D, uh, which is a piece of information that the swap chain needs to know when it's being created, okay? And then uh, we're gonna set the max frames in flight to two. And um, there are potentially circumstances where we want that to be lower, but basically what this means is that we're gonna be using um, triple buffering if we can. And um, when I say triple buffering, it basically means that we can have two frames being rendered to um, as we're drawing a third frame. And so that gives us a, a way to sort of very quickly draw um, frames at the same time that we're actually presenting them to the screen to give us higher frame rates and, um, and things of that nature. So, so we're gonna start off supporting triple buffering. And then uh, we'll fall back if we do not actually support triple buffering, okay? And so basically triple buffering is the max number of buffers we can have going at once, which is in our case is gonna be three. Um, and then we're saying, well, one of those is always gonna be presented at a time. So that means we can only write to two of those at a time. So this is what that, that represents, okay? Now, uh, the next thing that we need to do is, if you recall, we have a, um, a format that we need to actually determine, right? An image format for those images in the swap chain. So we actually need to choose a, um, a swap surface format, okay? And if you recall, we actually have um, in the device a swap chain support, format count, and formats array. So we can just kind of loop through that collection that we retrieved during device creation and uh, 
figure out what formats we have and use that. So in this case, we're gonna have a preferred format that we're gonna use. And uh, if we don't have that, I can come back and revisit this code, but I think every graphics card out there should have this, I believe. So um, if any of you guys run into problems with this, we can extend this, but for now, I'd prefer to keep this simple. So basically we're gonna say, um, we're gonna loop through all the formats and say if the format is BGRA, um, eight bits per channel, then we're gonna go ahead and um, use the color space sRGB, nonlinear KHR. We are going to set the swap chain image format to the current format, right? And then we're gonna say found equals true and then break, right? So we're starting off with found equals false if we get down here and we have not found um, a proper format, then uh, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and take the first one available in the formats list, okay? And so this is sort of um, just saying, this is the one I prefer. If we don't find that, just use the first one and roll with it and hope for the best. So the next bit of code has to do with present mode. And this is what basically changes the way that that queue works. So we have a few different present modes and actually um, I'm going to pull up the spec here one more time. Let's just go here. So we have um, a couple of different formats available. Uh, I'm sorry, we have a couple of different present modes available. And we actually have some extensions down here, which I'm not gonna be using. But the main ones that we're concerned with are these top three. And these all have different, um, different ways that they treat the queue, right? So, I'll leave the reading of this to you guys, but basically this FIFO mode KHR is the only one that's guaranteed to exist, right? So we start off with that as the default. Um, the Vulcan spec says that this one has to exist. So in order for a graphics driver to, um, to adhere to the Vulcan standard, this has to exist, right? So we're always minimally gonna have this one. And then uh, we could choose a difference uh, between either mailbox KHR or the other one that was here, which is immediate, okay? And basically the difference is FIFO, which is first in, first out, always displays all frames in a proper order, even when newer, more current frames exist. So what this means is like, if you're playing a movie or something um, where you always want all the frames to play, then that is maybe what you would use. But for games, that's not always necessarily needed because uh, you might be rendering and you probably will be rendering frames faster than you can actually draw them. And you want things to be as low latency as possible. So you don't wanna have this sort of backlog of images um, to sort of stack up that you have to go through because that's gonna wind up being um, not as responsive. And so, uh, what Mailbox shoots for is it basically says, use the most current one that exists. And this one by default uh, uses triple buffering. And so this is saying, use the most current image available and then throw out all the other ones, right? So if, we, if we've actually rendered two frames um, and we have two frames to choose from, it's always gonna choose the newest one. And that is how we get the lowest amount of latency between what's displayed on the screen and what the user is inputting um, into the game. So uh, ultimately, this is the one that we are gonna want to use. And then uh, we also have immediate mode, which is technically the fastest. So uh, it requires two images, but does not make the application wait for um, a vertical blank. But that also means it's, it's non-VSync, which means you might also get screen tearing. So um, it's not really something that we necessarily want to use unless we want to disable VSync for, for some reason, then we can use immediate. But uh, for now, I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to use um, mailbox mode if we actually have it. So basically what this does is it sets the presentation mode um, to FIFO by default. And then if it detects that we have mailbox available, it sets it to that and then um, breaks out of the loop, okay? Next, for good measure, we're going to requery the swap chain support because if something did happen like a display changed or a resolution change or something like that, 
we actually need to re-query the device to see what it's currently capable of rendering to. Next, we're going to take a look at the, the swap chain supports capabilities, specifically the current extent, right? And if it's not equal to UN32 max, which is basically a BS value, uh, then we're gonna update our swap chain extent to use that instead. So basically this is sort of a safeguard to say, if whatever was passed here is not valid or not um, supported by the device to override it with something that is, okay? Then we're gonna go ahead and make sure that that is clamped, right? To um, the min and max as provided by the GPU, okay? So uh, we actually don't have this K clamp defined. So a small detour in defines H all the way at the bottom. We'll go ahead and add our K clamp there. Basically takes a value min and max and then figures out um, if the value is between min and max and if not, it clamps it to those values, okay? So now that we have our clamped swap chain extent. The next thing that we're gonna do is we are going to obtain an image count. So we're basically gonna say, hey, swap chain, um, swap chain support capabilities, what is your minimum image count? And then add one to that, okay? And uh, that is basically going to be the number of images that we're gonna use. Now, 99% of the time, this is gonna wind up being two. Um, but, just in case, uh, if we happen to be in a scenario where the max image count um, is actually set to something greater than zero, but our image count is greater than that, meaning basically that this is one, then we're gonna roll with that instead, right? We're gonna say image count equals whatever is the maximum allowed by the device. So this is sort of a safeguard to make sure that we're actually doing something that the device supports. Okay. So the next thing that we need to do is set up our swap chain create info. So uh, that looks like our typical Vulkan structure, right? Just a, a VK structure type. It takes in the surface, the image count that we've gone ahead and cal uh, calculated up here, the image format, the color space, uh, the image extent that again, we made sure was clamped to something same our image array layers, which is always going to be one. Um, I won't necessarily go into what image array layers are right now, um, just for the sake of brevity, but uh, just make sure that's set to one for now. And then uh, the image usage, which is really important, which is basically saying uh, this is the color attachment bit. So those of you who are familiar with OpenGL will know this as the color buffer. So basically we're saying we're gonna use these images to render to the color buffer, if you will. So the next thing that we need to do is on the swap chain, we need to set up the Q family indices. So what we're doing here is we're checking the Q index of the graphics and present queues and saying, hey, if they're not equal, we are setting up an array of Q family indices. And then um, we are setting the image sharing mode to concurrent, I'll come back to that but basically that we are using two queues and uh, what the indices of those queues are. Otherwise, if they are the same, we are just using the same one down here and we don't actually have to uh, provide these things. Uh, we just say sharing mode exclusive, right? So if I pull up the spec once again, you can see here that the VK sharing mode only has exclusive or concurrent. So basically, um, exclusive specifies that uh, any range or image sub-resource of the object will be exclusive to a single family queue at a time. So what that means is basically, we're not gonna be sharing the images across different queue families, right? So we're saying here, if we only have one between these two guys, like they're the same, uh, then exclusive is fine because we don't have to share it. Whereas here, we want concurrent, meaning it can be used by more than one um, family index at a time. So since these are gonna be different here, we would want this concurrent and then specify um, what the difference is between those two, right? So that is that. And then I'll go ahead and fill out the rest of the create info. 
So the pre-transform, uh, this basically has to do, uh, this transform has to do with the presentation. It's, it's sort of a transform of the image versus the actual presentation. So an easy way to think about this is portrait versus landscape on mobile devices. So all we're doing for now is we are basically just using the current transform. Um, eventually, when we go to support other devices that need something different for the transform, uh, we'll go ahead and swap this out. But for now, um, we're just going to take the current transform as is. Composite alpha is basically the compositing mode, uh, and we want that to be opaque, right? So we're not going to have any sort of transparency um, in, in compositing, and compositing meaning compositing for the, uh, the windowing system that, uh, or the surface, I should say, rather, um, that ultimately interacts with the windowing system. So this has to do with that. We're always, in our case, going to use opaque. Uh, we, don't, we don't want to composite with uh, the operating system at all. Uh, present mode, obviously we're just passing that through. Um, we're indicating here whether or not it's clipped. Of course, we're going to want that to um, clip so that if we happen to render beyond um, what is actually shown on the screen, it actually gets uh, it actually gets clipped off so that we're not um, having to present all that. And then the old swap chain here, we're just passing a null pointer. Now, eventually, when we go to um, recreate the swap chain, we're actually going to want to pass this here. Um, but for right now, I'm not going to do that um, because it's um, in the interest of keeping things simple, right? So we could conditionally pass the old swap chain here, but I'm not going to do that for right now. Uh, we're just going to explicit, explicitly destroy the swap chain and create a new one. Okay. All of that to finally get down here to our main call, which is VK create swap chain KHR. So this is the bad boy that does all the work. So he takes a logical device, the swap chain create info that we've created here, of course the allocator, and then the uh, address of the handle to the swap chain, okay? Now, you would think that this would be sort of where we draw the line, but unfortunately it is not. So we have a swap chain and we've referenced these images that a swap chain has, but we've not actually created those images. So in Vulkan, an image typically is explicitly created. However, in the case of a swap chain, things are a little bit different. In the case of a swap chain, the swap chain when created actually creates the images that it's going to use as well. So since the swap chain creates those images, it is also responsible for destroying those images. So we don't actually have to create the images. All we have to do is basically get them uh, from the swap chain. So uh, there are a couple of things uh, in the swap chain that we're going to want to set up. Um, and there are a couple of things in the context that we are also going to want to set up as well. So. So if we go back to Vulkan types INL and we go to our swap chain, we see here that we have our array uh, for our images and our views, which are our views to those images. And then in our context, but there are a couple things we're missing um, sort of in both of these, right? In our context and our swap chain. So first off, uh, in our context, we need to store the swap chain, okay? This is because we're going to have to access this everywhere. So um, when we actually go to reference this in the renderer back end, we're going to need that. So that's the first thing. The next thing we're going to need is we're going to need a image index and a current frame. So our image index is basically going to be what image or the index of the image that we're currently using. Um, and then the current frame will come back to um, when we actually start filling out the rendering loop. Okay, and then there's also going to be one more, which is a Boolean for recreating swap chain. Uh, we might as well go ahead and get that in here because we, uh, this is a state that we have to track separately within our render loop. Uh, so let's go ahead and get that in there. Okay. So back in our Vulkan swap chain, we are now going to start off current frame to zero and we are going to set our image count to zero which is gonna be 
updated here in a second anyways, but I'd rather be explicit. So as with a lot of other calls in Vulkan, this is one of those deals where we have to obtain the count of something first and then fill out an array with its second. Okay, so this call to VK get swap chain images KHR takes a logical device, the swap chain handle, a pointer to our image count, and then we are passing zero to this P swap chain images, which is an array of uh, VK images, which is actually gonna hold our images that we retrieve here in a second. So we retrieve the count first, and then next, if our swap chain images is, basically doesn't exist if it's null, uh, then we're gonna go ahead and allocate uh, memory for that, right? And we're basically just gonna allocate um, an array the size of image count, right? And we're gonna just tag this um, with the renderer. And then we're gonna do the same thing for views while we're in here, right? And then we're gonna call this guy a second time, this time passing swap chain images, right? So this is our newly allocated memory that we're passing through, okay? And so this is what is actually going to obtain our images for us. Okay, so now we have our images, which again are provided to us by the swap chain. However, what the swap chain does not provide us with is image views. We actually have to create those ourselves. So. What I'm gonna do is create one for each image. We're gonna do a loop against image count and we're gonna have a view create info, right? And we're gonna have a VK structure type image view create. And then the image is going to be the image at that index of the images array. The image view type is gonna be a 2D because it's a 2D image. Uh, we're never gonna use anything other than the 2D image. So it's fine to, to go ahead and hard code this here. The format is gonna be the swap chain format that we chose before. The aspect is basically how the image is gonna be used. Again, we want uh, color because this is the color buffer, quote unquote, for you uh, OpenGL guys out there. The uh, base MIP level is basically for MIP mapping. Um, we're only gonna be having one level of that. So the base level is gonna be zero, it's zero indexed. Uh, and then we're gonna have one level. And then the array layer is gonna be the same thing, zero indexed, one layer. Um, and again, I'm not gonna go into this for now. For now, I just wanna move on. So uh, next we call our VK create image view, which is actually what creates our, our view for us, passing it the view at the index of I. So all of this here creates our image views. So it's not a terrible amount of code to it or logic, it's just something we gotta do. Okay, so the next thing that we're gonna need is we're actually going to need to create a image resource for something called the depth buffer. And I realize that for some of you, uh, this is probably gonna be jumping way ahead. And this is going to make the video a little bit longer, but I think it's worth it because we're only gonna wanna have to go through this once and I'd rather get it out of the way now than have to come back in here and do it later. So this is actually gonna be the last piece of this, but basically for those of you who are familiar with OpenGL, there's also something called a depth buffer which is essentially an image that gets written to containing uh, depth from basically the camera's perspective, uh, depth and space. And that helps us do all kinds of things such as lighting um, and sh shading uh, and things of that nature. There's a lot of things that we wind up using depth buffer for. Um, this is something that only is ever used in 3D engines for the most part. Uh, 2D engines don't really need to have this. However, uh, I'm going to go ahead and create this anyways because we are doing a 3D engine. I'm not going to start off with 2D and then jump to 3D. We're jumping straight to 3D. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and create this now. And for this, we actually need to add something to our device. So I'm gonna go to Vulkan device and we need to add one method to the bottom of the file which is Vulkan device detect depth format. And basically this is going to detect the image format that is gonna be required by our depth buffer. And it's going to return a true if it is able to successfully detect the format that we can use. Otherwise it's going to return false and we're not gonna continue. So in Vulkan device.c, I'm gonna go all the way to the bottom here and actually not quite all the way to the bottom. 
we'll go right below query swap chain support. So the first thing we're going to want to do is determine what our candidate formats are. And in this case, it's going to be in this order is what we're going to prefer. So what are these formats? Well, let's look in the spec one more time. Right, so here are the formats that we're going to be using, right? So we have um, this S float, which specifies a one component 32 bit signed floating point format that has 32 bits in the depth component. Uh, we're also using this one down here, which specifies a two component format that has 32 signed float bits in the depth component and eight unsigned integer bits in the stencil component. So this is if you're using a stencil buffer as well. Uh, and then the third one that we're using was this uh, 24 unorm8, which is which is this guy. So it specifies a two component 32 bit packed format that has eight unsigned integer bits in the uh, stencil component and 24 unsigned normalized bits in the depth component. So uh, this all has to do with depth and, depth and stencil buffers. So these are the formats in the order that we sort of prefer them in. So uh, if we do not find one of these formats, we're going to consider that a failure. So the next thing that we are going to do is keep hold of a flag. And in this case, uh, we're gonna say that our VK uh, format feature, we're gonna use um, this as the depth stencil attachment bit, which is basically, uh, it's, it's a usage on how we're gonna use the image, right? So depth and stencil buffers are sort of combined in this case. Next, we're gonna loop through the candidates and we are going to query the physical device format properties for that candidate, which basically says, hey, is this supported yes or no? And uh, it's going to look here at the linear tiling and optimal tiling features. And if it's supported for either one, then it's gonna say, yes, it's supported. If we get to the end of that loop and it is not supported, we're gonna be returning false. And then of course on the device, we are going to be saving that depth format um, to whatever candidate is there. So on the device itself, we do not have a depth format. So we are gonna to need to go back to Vulcan types and go to our device and store our depth format. And now when we go back, we are good to go. Okay, and that's all there is to it. We're basically just looping through these candidates saying, hey, do we have one that we support? If so, return true, and after setting uh, the depth format, okay? So uh, back in the swap chain, we're going to start by getting our depth format, okay? And uh, we're gonna just check to make sure that this was successful, and if not, we're gonna set it to uh, undefined and throw a fatal error. Now, this is something we may um, want to try and recover from, by maybe using a different format, but um, I don't think this is gonna be a recoverable error. Um, so for now, I'm just going to throw a fatal error message. And um, if it turns out we need to handle this differently, I'll look into it in the future. Okay, so last thing on the list is to actually create a depth image. So I mentioned a depth buffer is an image, right? So it's an image that gets written to with depth information the swap chain itself does not actually provide this to us. So we actually need to create an image. However, creating an image is something that we're gonna be doing a lot, right? We're gonna do it whenever, whenever we create a texture in the system, right? We don't wanna to have to be sort of having the same repeated Vulkan code all over the place on image creation. And so I actually want to set up a sort of utility uh, for us to be able to use to handle some of these common image operations for us. So to do that, I'm gonna create a new file, call it Vulcan image.h. And we're gonna have pragma once and uh, include Vulcan types, INL, as we might expect. And then we have uh, Vulcan image create, which takes a context, a image type, a width, a height, a format, uh, the tiling, which is something I'll get into in a bit, how the image is gonna be used, what memory property flags, if any, we need to actually set, 
whether or not we want to create a view to go with this image, any aspect flags that we may or may not need, and then a pointer to a Vulkan image struct that we're actually going to fill out. We don't have this yet, so obviously that is going to be the next thing that we need to set up. So under Vulkan types, I know, say above the swap chain, we'll go ahead and create Vulkan image. Vulkan image is pretty straightforward. As I said, there are three things that every image requires. A handle to the image, which is a VK image. Uh, a handle to the memory allocated by that image and an image view okay and this is very simplistic for now once we have uh, image pools uh, we'll probably have to do a little bit something different for this but for now I want to keep things as simple as possible so we have our handle our memory and our view and then we're also going to store the width and height just for convenience purposes okay so with that um, we have our Vulkan image filled out, so that's great. And then of course we have Vulkan image create. Uh, we also have Vulkan image view create, and this is just the sort of shortcut method for uh, view creation. If we already have the image, we can actually call this instead. So um, we've got that. And then finally, at least for right now, Vulkan image destroy, which just takes context in an image, okay? Obviously, we're gonna need an implementation for this. So we're gonna do that in Vulkan image.c. So we're gonna to want to include a Vulkan image and Vulkan device. And then we're also going to want to include K memory and our logger. So the first thing we'll go ahead and fill out is our create method, which takes a whole bunch of properties, but uh, that is because image creation is kind of complicated. So uh, we might actually convert this to be a struct in the near future, but for now, um, this is a little bit easier to handle and prevents us from having to create structs all over the place. That's why I didn't do it that way. So the first thing I'm gonna do is copy over the width and the height to the out image. And then next, I'm going to fill out, as you might have guessed, since we are creating a create info structure. So you'll notice I have several to do's in here, but let's walk through this real quick. So we have our structure type image create info. Our image type is a VK image type 2D. Now this is hard coded. Uh, we may need 3D images, but I made the decision to go ahead and hard code this for now. And if we need a 3D image, I will create a 3D image um, structure to use instead. Uh, and that is because of some of the ways that we might do things a little bit differently on other backends. So obviously uh, that's gonna have an extent. So it has width and height extents uh, for that particular image. And then the depth, since it's a 2D uh, image, we only have a depth of one, meaning um, you know it's not pixels deep, if that makes sense. Uh, MIP map levels, uh, we're gonna support four levels of MIP mapping. Um, you could just set this to one if you wanted to. For now, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna use four. Um, array layers, again, um, this is not something that we're going to be using. It eventually should probably be configurable, but uh, you know that's why I'm putting these to-dos here. These should all technically be configurable. Uh, the format, the tiling, or just pass-through. Um, the tiling basically talks about image layout. So what we generally want to use is optimal because it allows the driver to basically pick what the best image layout in memory is for that particular um, image format. Whereas linear basically says, no, you must store your data in a linear format um, in memory um, and only store it out that way. And that's not necessarily always the best. Now, the driver could do that under the hood, but this optimal basically allows the driver to specify internally what it wants to use. And then this, uh, this format modifier extension thing here we're not going to use. So really the only ones we care about is optimal or linear. And uh, in this case, uh, we are actually going to probably almost always pass optimal here. Initial layout is undefined, uh, which basically says that we are not transitioning this image from another memory layout that may exist somewhere else. That will come back into play later on when we go to handle textures. Uh, usage is just a pass-through. Uh, we are single sampling, so we're not multi-sampling our textures. And then uh, the sharing mode is exclusive. Um, and again, 
I'm not going to go into that too much for right now. Just sort of take that at face value. Because I will be here for hours on end explaining every single field here. So as you may have guessed, we have VK create image, which takes in this structure. It takes in the device, the image create structure, allocator, and then of course writes out to our image handle. Now our image is actually created. Great. So we have our image, but we've only filled out part of our actual structure here. So um, if you recall, we have our handle, we've got that, we have our width and our height, but we don't have the memory and we don't have the VM. Okay. So back here, we are next going to query the memory requirements for this particular image. And that is just a simple call to VK get image memory requirements and we pass it the device handle and the memory requirements struct to be filled out which is here so once we have the memory requirements uh, we need to actually ask the device what its memory index is for that particular type um, of memory and so I'm going to actually plug in something here that we have not yet defined called find memory index Okay, and basically this is going to pass the memory type bits. So it's a it's a um, a bit field, if you will, and it's going to pass that, and and it's also going to pass in the memory property flags that we've passed here while doing that search. Okay, and basically when it comes back, if it returns negative one, we know that's a failure, and we can throw an error. Okay, so we'll come back to actually defining this. I want I actually want to just finish out this this function first. So once we actually have the index that we need, we want to allocate the memory. So allocating memory in Vulkan is pretty straightforward. We create a allocate info. We say how much we want and what is the memory type. That is what we retrieve from this guy. We'll come back to that. And then we make a call to VK allocate memory, passing it the logical device, the allocation info, the allocator, and a pointer to the VK device memory handle that we store on our image. Okay. Next, we actually go ahead and bind the memory. So any operations that we do against this memory, we actually need to um, make sure that it's bound first. And so what this does is it basically takes the logical device, the handle, and the memory. And it also takes a VK device size, which is the memory offset. So if we're using image pooling, for example, we would want to pass the memory offset um, in that pool here. But we're not using that for right now, so I put a to-do here with a configurable memory offset to allow that in the feature. For the sake of simplicity, I want to keep this stuff as simple as possible. Okay, and then we call our, if our create view is actually true, then we default this to zero and we create our view by calling Vulkan image view create. We pass it the context format out image and the view aspect flags. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and just paste in the view creation because it's not very much code at all. So as you might imagine we have a create info just like a lot of other things in Vulkan where we define the image the view type the format and the aspect mask and then uh, I have a to do in here to make this configurable as well for mip mapping as well as layer counts but uh, for now those things are just set to some default values and then we call VK create image view which takes to the device create info allocator and view and it sets all those things up and creates our view for us finally we have our destroy method, which is even simpler, right? So checks to see if we have a view, destroys it. In fact, we should probably also make sure to set this to zero. Same with the image memory. And same with the handle. But it's essentially the same operation, right? We destroy the image view, we free the memory, we destroy the image. Okay. 
And then, uh, of course, we set those things to zero. So this is pretty straightforward stuff, I think. All right, so now let's come back up here to our context find memory index. This find memory index is something we've not defined yet. So we're actually gonna have to go to our Vulkan types and in our context, all the way at the bottom, we're gonna create a function pointer. And this is basically going to um, take in our type filter and our property flags and then return a 32-bit integer, okay? So to set this up, uh, we are going to go into, and you'll note that that fixes this, by the way. So this this is pointing to something now, uh, or so it thinks. So we need to go into our Vulkan backend, all the way to the top, and we have our Vulkan uh, render backend initialized, and this is where we're actually going to set up the pointer to that. So what we're going to do is we have a, this is sort of where we're putting our four de declarations. So I'm going to define find memory index here, and this is going to be sort of privately defined. And then, so right above where we have our to-do for our custom allocator, we are just going to point to find memory index. And then we are going to go all the way to the bottom of the file and paste find memory index down here. So what this guy is, is basically it takes in the type filter and property flags. It queries the physical device memory properties, saves them into this memory properties, iterates the memory type count, and then checks the flags of each one to see if the property flags match what we've passed, right? And if that is true, then it returns that index. If it gets all the way to the end and did not actually return here, meaning it did not find a suitable memory type, then we warn that and return negative one, okay? Okay, so that is everything there is to image creation for now. We are almost, almost there in terms of the swap chain. So now we can go back to the swap chain creation and we create our depth buffer, okay? So this, uh, we're just passing the context. We're creating a 2D image. Here's the extents. Here's the depth format that we detected here. Here's where we're using that tiling optimal to let the GPU decide that. Um, here's the usage. Here is the property, so um, the memory property. So basically this is saying that we want device local memory. We wanna use GPU memory, not shared memory. And then we do want to create a view. Uh, we have here, um, we're gonna use this as the depth buffer or the depth attachment rather. And then we're gonna save this off to the swap, the swap change depth attachment, which we haven't actually added yet. So back in Vulkan types to the swap chain, we are gonna add Vulkan image depth attachment. Okay, and that's where that's actually gonna live. All right, so that is everything for our create. Last thing we have to fill out is our destroy, which thankfully is actually vastly simpler. So the first thing that we do is we destroy our depth attachment. Then next, we destroy the views, but we only destroy the views, not the images. And this is because if you recall, the swap chain provides the images for us, but it does not provide the views. So since we don't have to create the images, we don't have to destroy the images. The swap chain does that. When we do destroy the swap chain, however, since we created the views, we have to destroy the views. So here we're just looping through the image count and calling VK destroy image view on each one of those indices, okay? And then finally, we call VK destroy swap chain at KHR, and this is what actually destroys the swap chain, okay? All right, so now we have everything in our swap chain filled out. And I think everything here looks pretty good. So now the next order of business is to actually hook it up to the back end. Uh, and in fact, one thing I'm actually going to do is I'm going to output K 
Okay, info. Swap chain created successfully. All right, just so we see that output um, because we're not going to be able to sort of verify it in any other way. Okay, so now we'll go back to the back end and in our initialize, which is towards the top, uh, we have here's our device creation. Okay, right here we are going to create our swap chain. Okay. And uh, we have not actually included swap chain. So we need to include the swap chain up here at the top. Let's put it there. And I believe, so we just need it there. And then in our shutdown, we will destroy our swap chain. Okay. So let's go ahead and build. Hopefully I didn't miss anything, but I did, of course. Uh, let's see, Vulcan image destroy. Did I not include, I did not include Vulcan image up here. Let's get that there, let's rebuild. Okay, built successfully. So, let's take a look at what we have here. So we see that our swap chain was created successfully. Okay. And if we look at our debug console, we do not have any validation errors in here. So I think we are actually good. So I'm going to go ahead and exit and upon exiting, it looks like everything is destroyed properly and we do not have any validation errors there either. So that means we are good to go. Um, and on that note, that is where I'm gonna end this video. Now, I know this video was quite long, um, especially compared to a lot of the ones more recently. So that's just gonna be the way that it goes sometimes. Sometimes these things are, are really long. We are not actually doing anything with the swap chain yet. We will eventually sort of tie all this stuff together, probably in a video of its own. But yeah, that is sort of the swap chain creation. And uh, so next we're going to create something called a render pass, um, which is something that uh, I will explain once we get into that. We're going to create our frame buffers. Uh, and then after that, we are going to go ahead and create some command buffers to start issuing some commands. And then uh, after that, we are going to create uh, some semaphores and fences, which is actually gonna be pretty quick. And then after that, it should be just tying up the render loop and we should be actually clearing at that point. So we're, we're getting close. The render pass is a little bit long, but not as long as the swap chain. So with all that said, uh, I'm gonna go ahead and end this here. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you learned, I hope you enjoyed. And if you guys run into any issues with this, please uh, leave a comment on the video or go ahead and hop on the Discord and that will help me see those issues and sort of hopefully correct them if, if they are an issue on my side. So thank you guys so much for watching. Go ahead and hit the thumbs up button if you like the video. If you haven't already, consider subscribing. Hit the little bell notification icon just to Make sure that you're notified when the next video in this or other series drops, and I will see you guys next time.